Racism has far-fetching effects on individuals, societies and the world at large. It perpetuates inequality, hinders social progress and fosters division among people. My guest today, Sully Alaji, was subjected to racism from a very young age. This racial discrimination followed him into the army when he joined the parachute regiment and although he eventually fought back against the bigotry and was no longer subjected to the physical side of it, it left him with psychological scars which have affected him ever since. Despite this, Sully defied the expectations of others and left the army after a career spanning four decades having reached the rank of lieutenant colonel. Today we talk about the racism he was subjected to growing up, joining the army, receiving multiple threats on his life from the others in his platoon, fighting in the Falklands conflict, and how despite reaching the rank of Lieutenant Colonel, he still had echoes from his past tell him he wasn't worthy. Welcome to the Stand Easy Podcast, sharing the stories of the men and women of the armed forces, past and present, who have achieved greatness. Your host is Crash Stevenson. Okay, Colonel Silly, thank you for joining me. It is an absolute pleasure. Um, by means of introduction, you are former Lieutenant Colonel in the Royal Army mm-hmm. Physical Training Corps, but you yeah. served within, was it 3 Paro? Yes, it was 3 Paro. 3 Paro prior to that. Um, where does your story begin? I guess it begins in Newcastle, where I was born, and we were the only family in that part of Newcastle, black family. So we were a family of curiosity uh, for the for the by and large of it. But then we were also a target as well because what I didn't realise, there was a thing called racism and I never knew what that meant when I was a child growing up. I just thought it was normal for people to come up and say things like, Samba, come here. And then you go across because in them days you had to have respect for adults because it was kind of almost Victorian. There was a bit of that kind of vibe going on and they'd come up you'd, you'd walk up to them and they'd feel your hair and say oh it's like a little gollywog and then they might say something like you know tell you to go and f off or or kick you up the backside or just say oh it's nice and walk away sort of thing so it was a mixed bag but you get used to it you know it, it happened all the time and then um it was childhood was good because you do what kids do but there was a flip side to it for being for being uh, black in them days, all my friends were great, but then there was in I think it was nineteen sixty eight, a politician called you know Powell came out with the Rivers of Blood speech, which was a, a red flag to unbeknown to me to the racists, but I could feel an immediate effect of that everywhere I literally went. I was getting names called, go back to where you come from. And I'd say in Newcastle, that would confuse him, so it'd hit me harder. Um, it was horrible. From that moment, it was horrible. The name Enoch Powell in our house was absolutely forbidden. Um, I didn't have a good mentor. My dad was Nigerian. He didn't tolerate much, and he, he, he used to uh, you know, discipline us with his fists, not his hand, with his fists. Uh, so it was quite a volatile life and home life environment. Schools were no better. The teachers would hit you. They'd throw the erasers at you. Um, it was normal business. And it was almost like, now, I've got to be careful here because I know there are some brilliant teachers out there, but the ones that we had, possibly because I was in the, the lowest class, because I, I was dyslexic and I didn't know that at the time I found out when I was 40. So it stands the reason I'd probably be in the lowest class. And they would, there, there are two methods of teaching. There was the one who would come in with a nice cup of coffee and a chocolate bar of some sort, and we were all drooling at the mouth. He put it down, and we were hoping that he'd walk out so he could nick it, but it never happened. But he would then say, right, get out your, your textbooks, and get out your writing books, and copy from the textbook page X from paragraph X to X. And that, that was it. We'd have to sit and just copy out, copy and paste, but with a hand and a pen. And then the other teachers would then write on a blackboard. It was a board, it was black, and there was white chalk on it. It's not a problem. And um, they'd write on it, and we'd have to copy it. And that was it. The only teacher that I really enjoyed, those two, one who taught me how to play chess, 
And I actually beat him. But when I look back, he played a blinder. He let me believe I beat him. And by doing that, he did it just right because my confidence went through the ceiling, which was unusual for me. But the other teacher would talk about religious education. And he'd sit there and, and, and just tell us t- tell the story. And be- because being dyslexic, you kind of, your brain's slightly wired up different, not wrongly, slightly different. And it means that I have an incredible imagination. And I'd be sat there daydreaming about floating across the pyramids or in the reed beds with Moses in the basket flowing past. You know, I could actually see it and live it. It was quite a unusual thing for me. So I wasn't that religious, but when you're when a teacher's telling you something, you know, it was going in there. It was, it was fantastic. So by and large, school wasn't good for me. It really wasn't because of the way the teaching, they didn't understand people with learning difficulties. They just thought you were stupid, difficult. Um, and then it, it got worse, got in with the wrong crowd, et cetera, as most kids do. And I, and I get that, but it's because no one took any interest in me. And I put my hands up. It was me who did it. So I'm not I'm not trying to blame people for that. But there was a contribution by other people because let's face it, I'm a kid. I know no better. I'm born in a council estate and there is this unwritten law and you can feel it wherever you go. Where is that? You're not worthy. You've got to stay down there. And, and my life would have been in Newcastle. I'd either be dead on drugs, even though I don't take them, um, alcoholic, or have loads of kids by different women, or be in jail. That was it. Or have a rubbish job. That was it, because the teachers, they didn't invest in you. When it came to formative years, the teacher would say, for the boys, you're going to be working in the shipyards at Swan Hunters, or in a factory. And for the girls, you're going to be a hairdresser or a secretary. That was it. That's as much faith they had in us. Whereas kids nowadays, they've, <laughs> they've got Masses of opportunities, huge opportunities, and the teachers encourage them to go for it. Have you thought about doing this? Have you thought about doing that? No, for us it was your boy, shipyard, or in a factory, and that was it. That's how much they believed in us. So there was an overwhelming feeling of oppression being pushed down, and you're going to stay there. I remember one day my um, my parents bought me a chocolate bike, which was absolutely unbelievable because we didn't have two pennies rubbed together, but somehow they managed to get me this chocolate bike. It was the only best present I've ever had. And I rode it and rode it and rode it. And I remember I was riding uh, to this, what I thought was a motorway. There was two lanes that way and two lanes that way. And I thought, that must be a motorway. So I've never seen a motorway before. And I was watching the cars going that way. I'm thinking, they must be going to London. I want to go there. I don't know why. I was about 11. I want to go to London, but I don't know why. I just want to get out. I just urged to get out of Newcastle, out of them constraints of a council estate because... Because they say you live on a council estate, you can't make anything of yourself. Well, got news for you, buddy. There are so many professional captains of industry, top scientists, professors, people in the forces at high rank that come from a council estate. It's who you are that makes you, not what people tell you. Because mm. people tell you because they just want to oppress you for some some statistic reason. So I was looking, thinking, I want to go to London. And funny enough, when I joined the army and I bought a car, I thought I'd reminisce and drive around where I used to go when I was a child and I got that bridge and it's only the ring road for Newcastle so I would have been going around these circles <laughs> <laughs> who knew <laughs> but anyway then um, I decided uh, I joined the cadets because I was getting some so much stupid trouble and the cadet force is a fantastic organisation even though when I was a child we thought they were quite lame and Real, real men when you when you're 12 you're a real man <laughs> you don't join that kind of thing but actually i joined it and you know what it was a smashing organization and they said to me "Suli, well done and i said sorry because i've never heard that sentence before ever up until that point but again being dyslexic i've got what i call superpowers so for example they showed me how to strip a weapon and i can do it like that you know even with the eyes closed i could do it so i remembered it and they said, well done. I'm like, wow, I like this. This is, this is praise. I've never heard of praise before. It was always, oh, gee, get out there, you're a stupid boy. And when a teacher tells you you're stupid every day, because I couldn't read, the words were moving around. Uh, so when I was at school, I'd, I'd get up and read. It was my worst nightmare. He didn't help me. He just told me that I was stupid and I, I had to stand on my chair or stand in the corner of the classroom 
being ridiculed by the teacher saying I was stupid, that boy's stupid, and all this class looking at me. And when you're a child, you especially when you're dyslexic and you're not not very articulate, it's hard to come back. And if you do come back, you'll get a slap off the teacher anyway. So it's pointless. So you feel you feel trapped, unwanted, unloved. And for God's sake, you're only a child. You're a child. You need guidance. You need con someone to give you that confidence and tell you, okay, that's not not quite the right way of doing it. Have you tried this? Have you tried that? Because by saying, have you tried this? Have you tried that? You stimulate the brain and you start, and I would start thinking, no, I haven't. So if I try that, perhaps I can try this. And I contribute to that bit of learning. Whereas if you say, you've done that wrong, do it this way. You're still wrapped around the negative. I'm not saying that you should say that you haven't won, you've come second or you've lost. That's fine because that's part of life. But when it comes to teaching people with, with a bit of a, a learning difficulty, if you like, then there's a different way of doing it. And the teachers nowadays have got that, which is great, because I say that when I do my talks at the schools. But anyway, I decided that I joined the cadets, and then um, I did three years, then I, I left. And then uh, there was bits that in my life that uh, I won't disclose here because I am writing a book. But I, I ended up um, joining the Royal Marine Reserves, fantastic organisation. And I wanted to be a Marine. And bear in mind, I had no mentor. We went down there, we did all the training, so my, my, my weapon hand skills were, were okay. And then we went to Limston, down to Limston. It's the first time I've travelled out to Newcastle properly. I was like, wow. It's not a holiday, it was two weeks of hell, basically. But when I got there, I was at the front on all the endurance. And I'm thinking, wow, these can't be that fit because I'm at the front, because I had no idea. I'm thinking, these can't be that good. How wrong was I? I just didn't know I was really fit at the time. I just thought it was Joe Average. And so I, I just, it turned me on my head, basically. I thought, well, I'm not going to join them because it's not that fit. And also, they didn't look as big as they did in the cartoon books that I was reading. You know, <laughs> you know it's all put through down to perception and mentoring and being informed, which I wasn't. Uh, so um, we were jealous of a friend who joined the Paras. So anyway, we went to the we were stubborn we went to the navy shop to join the marines i feel the eye test thank god and my friend feel the aptitude test so we went next door and joined the army and the rest was history joined the parachute regiment i then went to uh brown and barracks in aldershot and that was a eye opener for me the it was great because i was fit and i realized i was fit because i was either first or second on all the physical fitness tests. On the weapon handling skills and all that, I was good shooting. Those guys who got better eyes than me, so they were, you know, they left me behind. But um, I, I was a good old a steady all rounder and I was doing well. Um, and when it, uh, when there was one occasion when, well, I say one occasion, the start of this repetitive occasion was when I was marching from my block to get some lunch and I heard the window open and I heard this corporal shout nigger do you want me to say nigger or n-word no no you, you can say what you need to yeah right. yeah so he shouted nigger so being the only black person there apart from someone who was in the Petunia platoons uh, so he was uh, about 16 years of age uh, but being the only recruit there who was black I came to attention and turned and looked at the corporal and he's on the first floor window and he was growling at me and said, nigger, I'm going to get your back squatted. Then I'm going to fuck the arse off you. Now, that really shocked me because there was people walking around. There was officers, there were sergeants. There was people walking around camp and nobody batted an eyelid. No one said anything. No one came to my help. It was like normal business. And that's what I now know as institutionalized racism because it doesn't mean that everybody there was a racist. It doesn't mean that at all. And that's where some people get that wrong. As soon as you mention institutional racism, they think, oh, that's it, everyone's a racist. They're not. It just means that that behavior was allowed to go on unchecked. Um, and that's the difference, the massive difference. And I want to make that very clear that I'm not saying the regiment is a racist regiment. It is not. Uh, every time I was marching in camp, he would do the same thing open the window, shout the same thing. It, it really wore me down. And actually, when I developed, going forward, my 
the end of my 41 year career in the army, I developed PTSD and that was one of the triggers what he did because it really affected me. I didn't know it affected me at the time, but I just thought he was a, an idiot. And if I had been any other situation where I wasn't in the army, I would have beat the crap out of him because I got quite handy. Um, because my brother was two years older than me and people used to fight with him and used to beat them up because he was hard. So then people who were two years older than me, and when you're a child, that two year gap is massive. Mm. They used to beat me up. And at first I used to get beat up, but then I got, got pretty handy with my hands. So when this corporal said that to me, I thought, if we won service street, I would, I would, I would beat the crap out of you because you deserve it. Because that's the only language that re- then, then, and I'll stress that, then, that racist understood. Because it was rife, it was allowed to go on. It was the norm. And I'm not saying everybody was racist, but you could say things and no one would help you, as demonstrated in Depo Para. I then uh, got through training, and this is the bit, I only reflected on it last week, actually. <clears throat> this is the bit that got me. I was, without doubt, the best soldier there. But what the staff didn't like at that time was if you were a cadet, um, because you got unfair advantage. And I thought, well, isn't that part of preparation? It's like if if I was if my dad was a, a, a maths uh, professor and I'm doing my um, exams at university and he gives me a hand and I understand it, does that mean I got unfair advantage? It's because I and will I will I not win if, if I if I get the high score? Would they say, oh, you can't help it because your dad's a professor? That's effectively what they're saying, or they were saying back in the day. And it was only last week I thought, well, I could have been the best recruit there. I know I should have been because I knew what I was doing. But it, it's just one of them things that, you know, when you reflect on life, you think, oh yeah, and another thing. Anyway, we passed, I passed training. Then I got into a bit of trouble because wherever you go in the, in, in, in the 70s, um, whenever you go to a pub or somewhere, someone would shout out nigger in the bars. And it was, it was normal. If it didn't happen, I'd be like shocked. That's how normal it was. And this one day, I went into the pub one evening and the guy said, shouted nigger and um, I smacked him quite rightly so at that time. Not appropriate now. And I got arrested. So I had to wait for the court case, yada, yada, yada. So all my all my platoon went to Germany and to the other units that they were going to, the other battalions. And I was waiting around for six months doing all manner of odd jobs. And then I, I managed to, um, the, the court case came up, I was fined. The judge, <laughs> the judge, yeah, what a classic guy. I'm sick of you powers coming around here causing trouble. You know, and, and the evidence was for me, not against me when I explained it to him. And uh, he said, no, I'm just sick of you power troopers. There's a fine, get out. So, you know, that's what it was then. How, much, how much was the fine? Can you remember? It was hmm. £100 and £50 cost. All right. So the thing was, I punched this guy once. Six months later, he finally comes to court. And the court showed me these photographs. And as he's pho- a photograph of this guy, his face has been hit with a shovel. I mean, his nose is all over the place and his lips all over the place. And he's got a black eye. And I said, I, look, I thought, look at my fist. And I thought, there's no way it was one punch. There's no way I could do that much damage. Then I looked at the date. And the date was, um, now I did it. I hit him six months ago, but the date was like two months ago. So obviously he's been in a fight since. And I said to the judge, you're on it, 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 That's I couldn't have done that. That's a lot of damage for one punch. And even the date would suggest that they're, that they're fresh wounds then. And you can see the date. So that happened way after when I hit him. And that's when the judge, he mustn't have liked being told the obvious from a, color, a person of a, with a tan, shall we say. So anyway, it's all history. I'm, I'm not, I'm not sour, uh, sour about it. It's just like, that was one of them things that happened, you know? Um, it was known. You either live with it, get on with your life, or you let it affect you. And it really does affect you if you let them get in the cracks. Yeah. So then I got, I went off to Germany, got there during the Cold War, which was a very scary and interesting time. And then I, I put my first load of luggage in my room. I went to get my second lot, came back. The first lot had been thrown everywhere, basically. Suitcase open, kit everywhere. And I thought, ha ha, very funny. And as I was clearing it up, I felt the presence. When I looked around, there was a shotgun on my face, double barrel shotgun. And the guy said, welcome to the B Company, nigger. And again, my instincts wanted to wrap that rifle, uh, uh, barrel, double barrel shotgun around his head. But my training corporal, a guy called Dave Nichols, who ended up 
going to the Army Air Corps and getting to Lieutenant Colonel, was a brilliant training corporal, really fair, one of the, the best one there, in fact. And he, he told me on my pass-off period, he says, when you go to Germany, you're going to get a hard time. I said, I know, Corporal, we all are. We're, we're going to be known as Crows, the new boys. And he said, no, you're going to get a harder time because of the colour of your skin. And I said, ah, that's all right. I've, <laughs> I've lived with it for all my I'm life. Used to it by now. Yeah. But he warned me off and he said, look, the best thing to do, my best advice is leave it, let it go. And in six months' time, they'll forget about you and you'll be, you'll be accepted. So them words were tattooed and engraved and carved into my head. So when this guy who stood there with his barrel, the first thing I flashed from my mind was kill him. And then the second thing was, no, leave it, leave it. Because no doubt I would, I could have done some serious damage with him. Um, but I didn't know it was loaded. And then my corporal said what he said. So I thought, okay, I'll let it go. That night, I was lying in my bed. Now, I'd been segregated by all these lockers. It was a big eight-man room and it segregated me. So I was in my own little prison, if you like. And then the lights went out. And I thought, I'd better go to sleep then. And then my nose felt funny. And I'm thinking, what the hell? So I went and turned the light on, and the room was full of CS gas. And I looked down at the floor, and there was a tin, a tobacco tin with two CS pellets in. So I opened the door and pushed it out. I came back in. So I ran to the window, tried to open the window, but they banged in six-inch nails uh, that were sticking out, you know, really crudely done. And I thought, right, uh, what am I going to do? And I remember I had my gas mask uh, respirator in my locker, so I thought, I'll get that. So I got that pit on my bed, and I thought, <laughs> You're not going to get me. I've had harder than that. And then next day, walking around the lines, it was just, you know, every time you went past the building or block where there were some soldiers, it was like monkey noises. It was, it was, it was just horrible. I felt so alone. Yeah, I was there by myself. The guys in my platoon who had then then been there six months were told not to speak to me. They were warned off, and and I found out afterwards. And I felt sorry for them, but I was just so lonely. And, you know, to be honest, I was scared. I'm in a foreign country and I'm getting this. And I'm thinking, the thing that got me was I was thinking, listen, I've trained as hard as you. I've done what you've done. And in some cases, probably done it better than you. And yet you're not accepting me. Why? Oh, it's because of the colour of my skin. Is that it? Is that it? The colour of my skin? Really? So anyway, then that, that day when I got on after lunch, um, in the room, there was a, a photograph of a guy who they, they hung, a black guy. And I didn't know it was staged. It looked real to me. And I said to a friend of mine who was in, in my platoon, um, I said, look, Chris, if, if they do hang me, if there's an opportunity, will you cut me down and I'll go AWOL? Now, I would never go AWOL, but I just I just didn't know what to do. And Chris, and I look I look at Chris uh, uh, now and think, oh, my God, I put him under so much pressure. But he was trying to say, it's going to be all right. It's just a prank. But he couldn't because there's too many people there. So he was trying to give me that assurance look, but without saying anything. Mm -hmm. So I'm pitting his life at danger as well. Anyway, that night I'm lying in bed and the lights went out. And I went, oh, that happened last night. Something bad happened. And then I saw this orange light around the side, the edge of the doors, because the doors in Germany, were really big and the ceilings were really high and then in came three people in KKK outfits and with a burning cross and all I can say is my insides turned to liquid and how I didn't crap myself at that time I, I is beyond me I literally shit myself three guys with burning cross with all the kit on and then they were there, they seemed to be there for some time, but you know how things seem longer than what they really are. Mm. And I remember thinking to myself, I went, I went from fright to, 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 to fight. And I thought, right, I'm going to die. That's on the cards. I'm going to die, but I'm going to go on with the fight. So I'm going to kill the first guy. I'm going to bite his Adam's apple out through his mask. Then the second guy, he will hit me, but I'm going to try and hit him while I'm still chewing this guy's Adam's apple, but the third guy's going to kill me. Whatever the case, I'm dead. As long as I kill one of them, I'll be happy. And then they walked out. And I'm, obviously I couldn't sleep that night. I was just sat up in bed. Just couldn't, I was stunned, shocked, and couldn't believe what happened. Couldn't believe that nobody in that block saw them with a burning cross walking down the corridor and didn't say anything to them. There was corporals there, Lance corporals uh, and private soldiers. 
Now you thought the corporals would have said something, but you know, it would unbelievable. The sergeants and the officers had all gone home because it always happens at night. So you know, they want to know. The next morning, and this is a great example of ticking the box in the negative verb. My sergeant major came into the block room and he said, Halaji, you okay? And I looked around, people there, and I went, yeah, I'm okay, sir. He says, no, are you really okay? I says, yeah, I'm okay, sir. What do you expect this year? Tell, tell him what happened in front of all these people. And anyway, what could I say? Well, um, I got a shock in my face. Who was it? I don't know. It was a white, I, I'll give you a clue, though. It was a white guy. Um, I got gassed. Who was it? I don't know. I saw white hands. So, again, it's got to be a white guy. And uh, I got Ku Klux Klan coming last night with the burning cross. Who was it? I don't know, but I'll give you two clues. It's probably going to be white, and they probably still smell of petrol, you know? Like, mm. what do you want me to do? He didn't take me to a safe place. He didn't ask me, you know, if you if you want if you want authority and you're talking to a subordinate and you say, right, tell me what happened, it's authoritative. So the, the person's going to shut up. But if you sit them down, I must say make them a cup of tea and a sandwich and all that, but if you sit them down in a comfortable position in, in a, a relaxed environment and then say, look, I'm just, you know, you're new and everything. And, and not to say what happened, you, you build it up so that that person feels compelled to tell you because you are now you are now a friendly face rather than the crap that I've just been through. But he was just ticking his box and he probably went back to the mess and had a few beers, I don't know. But yeah, that was that was a great example of just ticking the box. And I, I remember that as a bad lesson. We then would go on exercise and I would have to put the burdens on the back of the wagon and run. Uh, that happened a couple of times. Um, I got filled in a couple of times on my bed. And the thing is, the guys the guys who filled me in, um, I could, one of them, I, I was, was on the box team with me, so I used to beat him up every day in sparring, and the other one I could have beat up anyway. But that, the words from my corporal were firm and centre, leave it, leave it. And if I hadn't been such a, a follower, such a, an idiot back then, I would have just exploded and beat the crap out of them. But I, I was so obedient and... Um, you know, I just went went with it. But every day for them six months, I was hoping tomorrow's going to be a better day. And it never was. Until the day I went into the cook house. And the guys in my section who would talk to me, we were sat there having some food. And I said to this guy from another platoon behind me, can you pass a plant of ketchup? And he did all over my clothes. And then he went and he went, he got up and left. And I said to the guys on my table, what would you do? Before the lips, the words even come out of the lips, fill them in. I'd gone. Ran down to his room and I gave him a good beating. And it was six months of frustration taken out on his face and his face just exploded. And then the next day I got put in a boxing team because it was boxing season. And I thought this is my chance to show the battalion that if they're up with me, there's a chance I'm going to beat the crap out of them. So I went to the boxing team. On the first day, I had three fights. I knocked them all out. Second day, I think I had, or the day afterwards, I think I had two fights. And I had one fight with a guy from C Company. He was a good little boxer, actually, and I was really enjoying it. And, and, I, and it was because the other ones, I was just angry. And I was, but now I'd calmed down a little bit. And this, because this guy could box, he encouraged me to box because I thought, this is really good. And um, I think halfway around the first round, of, oh, it would have been the second round. And um, sorry, the third round, it was definitely the third round because the first two rounds, I was thinking, this is brilliant. And then it, 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 just at the start of the third round, the guy who, who actually filled me in, but I used to beat the crap out of him because he was, he was thick, thick as two short planks because he, he, on the boxing team, he knew I'd beat the crap out of him, but at night, he'd give me verbal. I'm like, are you stupid? Every day in early, are you stupid? So, you know, I used to enjoy beating the crap out of him because he was, he was a dick. He, he shouted from the audience, kill the nigger. So I stopped, I jumped on the ropes. The referee was shocked. The person I was boxing was shocked. And I said, when I finish this one, I'm going to fucking come out there and beat the crap out of you, you wanker. And I got back to the ring and I hit the guy so hard, his gum shield came out and I, gave him a, I got a technical knockout, which disappointed me because I was enjoying boxing him, you know? Yeah. But uh, yeah. And again, this idiot was allowed to say that and no one said anything. It was like normal. Even me jumping on the, on the ring, the ropes, you know, that was normal. I'm thinking, looking back, I'm thinking, what is wrong with you people? Mm. But yeah, after that, nobody gave me a hard time apart from one person. I'm definitely not going to mention his name, um, but he was kind of rotund uh, and he had an accent and that's all I'll say, but he was a horrible, nasty piece of shit. And in the naffy, 
we'll go for a beer. He'd have a go at me. And I gave him both barrels verbally. So, but I didn't want to touch him because I just didn't want to catch anything off him. He was that toxic. He was such a racist. It, it came out of his breath. It came out of his nose. It, came, it just oozed off him. He was so horrible and nasty. But I just did not want to touch him because I didn't want to catch it. Nasty, horrible person. Went to Northern Ireland. I proved myself there in the contact. So again, I'm proving myself all the time that I am able to do my job. And I'm thinking, this is great. The guys were great. Everything was great. That was a bad start, but everything now was great. And then we went to the Falklands and Johnny Weeks, who is an amazing the legend. He is the legend. He was an amazing sergeant major. Um, he, I'm getting goosebumps now just talking about him. He's that impressive and he's had such an impact on my life. He did hit, like, we were in the forming up line. Now, for those who are listening to this and don't know what a forming up line is, this is the last chance saloon. You are when you go over that line, you're gonna fight. And this was we were gonna fight an attack Mount Longdon in the Falklands. So this was it. This is the last bit of saneness before you go into complete hell. And Johnny Week said something along the lines of, This is gonna be a hard battle. There's gonna be some years that are gonna not gonna come back, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, you might want a moment now to think about who you want to pray to. If you want to pray to someone, go and have a, a word with yourself, uh, but do the best you can, blah, blah, blah. And then he said, fix bayonet. So I just stood there and put my bayonet on, and I was just focusing on what I had to do. And this nasty, horrible, disgusting excuse of a human being came up to me, and he said, I hope you die, nigger. And I'm like, what? We're in a war. We're just about to go to a battle. And you said that to me. I can't. And I said, you better fuck off or I'll kill you now. And then I thought, look, Sudi, get out of your head. You don't need to think about that. You need to concentrate on the job at hand. Otherwise, I would have just gone up there and got myself blown to pieces because I would have been so distracted from what that nasty, nasty, mm. horrible person said. Anyway, we, were, we um, went across the start line. We were approaching... Mount Longdon, it was dark, it was cold, it was, the night was still, and I could see this mountain, and it kind of reminded me of a, a cartoon like Scooby-Doo, where you see the, the scary castle, I remember thinking, that's my nemesis, and you know, I didn't give that thought, that that racist, any, any airtime at all after that, I was just concentrating on what I had to do, and then as we were approaching the Argentinians, who were who were bloody good soldiers? Um, they they were doing their what, what what you should do. They were picking up illuminating mortar rounds to save anybody out there. And every time they did that, we got down and we got so close. And I thought we're going to be on top of them before they know it. And then I heard bang, and Brian Mills, another good guy, really good guy. He um he actually started the battle. I mean, what <laughs> what I came to fear that is. But the cost of, you know, he paid the price. He stood on a mine and blew his leg off. And that guy was in agony. Um, then the whole world lit up. And there is a picture floating around where there was loads of trace arounds, which are the bullets that have light at the back that burns. So you can see all these, you know, there's hundreds of these bullets in the air on this photograph. What you don't see is the other four non-tracer bullets behind them. So you can you multiply that by five. That's how many bullets mm. were going down. And we were stuck in the middle of that. And we walked through the minefield, and I knew I was in the minefield. Uh, it was horrible thinking that next step, your leg, your well, it could be your foot or your groin, because there are two types of mines. One that jumps up and blows your groin away. Walking through that, I was absolutely petrified. We, 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 we finally got through the minefield, and we started fighting. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail about the fighting. Suffice to say that on reflection... There are 12 occasions where I should have been either shot or blown up um, or sniped, um, which, looking back, I, I, <laughs> I feel so lucky, absolutely so lucky. But it was a hard fight. We were fighting up a hill. We had wet feet from day one from the landing. Um, I had nine tops on and five bottoms on. That's how cold it was. As a consequence of that, I got non-freezing cold injury. And I, I actually went to the hospital in 2015 because I was sick of people telling me, go to the hospital, go, go, go to the Naval um, School of medicine, medicine to get checked out. And it took that long for me to go. 
to go. And when I went, the doctor gave me a bollocking <laughs> for leaving <laughs> so late, which I found I found quite amusing. But yeah, we to see your friends blown up. One guy was vaporized, nothing left. Other guys got bits blown off them. It was horrible. And those things that we weren't trained for, for example, taking our dead bodies. Mm-hmm. I've never done that. We've done prisoner handling, all that kind of stuff, but that's the only thing that we hadn't done. And I wasn't expecting the action that I, I had in um it's too gruesome to 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 for me to recall again. But it was another one of my triggers. It was horrible seeing your dead colleagues just lying there. Um it was a nightmare and, and that's why I had treatment therapy for my PTSD for three years because of that and because of that also a cor- corporal as well and other, other corporals who decided to be nasty but yeah that that, that war in the Falklands um, I reflect on it quite a lot now and I've been back twice and I made I've, I've, made, I've made friends with so many people Falkland Islanders and you know I went the first time I went back I wasn't too sure if we'd done the right thing but after meeting them, yeah, absolutely, we did the right thing. They are so patriotic. They are British. They are real British people, um, more patriotic than a lot of people here are, if I'm being honest. So, yeah, um, 23 of our finest paratroopers died. I think it was 43 were injured. Um, it was the bloodiest bat- battle in terms of dead and wounded of the whole Falklands, I believe. We did have some issues. We had some rubbish ammunition that didn't work. But, you know, that's what a paratrooper does. Um, adapts and overcomes. Mm-hmm. And that's what we did. And one of the things I did, uh, I, mean, I do a, a command leadership management presentation now. And I was thinking, what can I put in it? And I thought, yeah, you teach them right. They will do the job. And what I mean by that is they shouldn't rely on the chain of command for doing the job. The chain of command should be able to go away and the soldiers, the unit still carries on. If it doesn't, it means that chain of command is not actually mentored their people or mm. told them told them what each department does. So your department closes down because they've got no communication with the department. You need to mentor your people. So that's what the, what will happen to us. We when when our corporals and sergeants and, and platoon commanders went down, we just carried on. It was private soldiers, right? Go left flanking salt and pepper all the way, you know, one way and the other one, uh, and taking out the objectives without having to wait for the corbels to tell us, you know, so that, that's that's a good thing about the Paris and the Marines. They, they have the ability to, to to carry on. And and I'm not saying that the rest of the army doesn't, I'm just saying Paris and Marines in the, in, back in the day, because now we've got a lot of different regiments, mm-hmm. units that have got a lot of combat um, experience and they know what they have to do. But yeah, it was... Um, it was a war worthy of fighting for. It was the last conventional war that we've had. And what I mean by that is we had an army that would fight back. And Argentinians fought back. Their snipers were outstanding. Their motor fire controllers were outstanding. We took on, on Mount Longdon, the special forces, paras, marines, professional soldiers, and conscript soldiers. And they put up a bloody good fight. One sniper held the, the company down, just one sniper. He shot three of us and he held the company down. So we brought in all manner of ammunition, rounds, even gun, naval gunfire. And then we got up and he shot us again. It's like, what? You know, they were, they were really good. So, I, you know, I, I got my caps to the Argentinian in their professional professionalism because mm. they were a really good, um, really good, really proficient army. And also, this was the largest flotilla that we'd ever put together since Second World War. There's over 100 ships, and quite a few of them were merchant fleet ships, civilian cru- light, well, cruise liners, and I was out yeah. on the camp. So, yeah, it was a hell of a, a, hell of a um, achievement, which was fraught with some failures, which have been um, on the TV, so there's no need to go over them again now. But, yeah, yeah. but... The, the thing that you will never get away from in war is the fog of war, the mm. communication. We call all, all that we call it the fog of war because that war is chaos. You know, it's not like going for a, to learn a few moves on dance floor or gymnastic moves. It's like when it really happens, things change and they change really fast, and and you've just got to overcome and adapt and 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 work with it. 
But yeah, um, price to pay is a big price to pay for me personally. With three years of deep, deep therapy, um, nightmares, non-physical injury, which means I can't go out in the cold or I do have to wear so many boxing gloves, wear gloves that look, they look like boxing gloves on yeah. my hands. Um, you know, so it, yeah, it's but you just get on with it, you know. I'm not going to moan about it. I'm just going to crack on. It's not going to stop me from doing what I want to do. And so when you when you came back from the Falklands, you joined the. It was just the Army Physical Training Corps at the time? Yeah, um, so I came back from the Falklands in 82, and then I stayed with the Paras. We went to the jungles of Belize in 84, which is amazing. Soldiering, soldiering in the jungle is a brilliant experience. I think once you get used to the fact that you're not going to stop sweating, <laughs> as soon as you come to terms with that, it can be enjoyable. I spent six weeks there in 2010, and the first sort of 48 hours, I'm like, I, I I can't go on like this. I can't. And then just something clicked in my mind. And I'm like, right, fine, fuck it. You're not going to stop sweating. Just go on with it. Just go and enjoy yeah. it. How I explained it to somebody, I said, when the plane door opened, it was like walking into the, a really hot sauna and then someone throwing a bucket of hot water over you. Yeah. <laughs> it was hideous. But what we did, when, after we were climatized, we went on patrol in the jungle and it's great it really is because you, you, you're doing proper patrol and you know one step at a time sort of thing and then we thought we'll get back so we tabbed back and we were tabbing so much we were trying to get back before the rain the monsoon came down we were melting so when it, when it started rain at three o'clock on the dot we just stood outside like that with our arms up Less. getting a shower <laughs> but the other thing is you can't use soap or toothpaste in the jungle because you can be smelt miles away so we we absolutely stunk. I mean, we cleaned our teeth with other stuff, but not not with anything with any kind of fl- uh, smell in it. And um, I looked at my skin, and for those who don't know, I am black or brown, but my skin was grey in the jungle. It went grey, and it smelled like dead skin. It was horrible. <laughs> I remember saying, "I'm I'd love to bottle this up and give it to somebody for a laugh." <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I loved the jungle, and then I had a poignant, mo- poignant moment coming back from the jungle. I was thinking. Right. I've been in Northern Ireland, I've been to war, I've been to jungle. What else is there to do? Back in the day, there wasn't that much to do. Just Northern Ireland. And I thought, I'm going to get bored. And when I'm bored, I get in trouble. So I decided to go for the PT Corps, the Royal Army Physical Training Corps. It's a year's training or thereabouts. And then um, I started in 95, 85 um, in January and finished in November. And I took a post in, in, in January. As a sergeant, so I started as a lance corporal. I jumped straight to, to sergeant because you come out as a sergeant, uh, and then um, I just kept getting posted and getting promoted. And I got the W one, one of class one, like a regimental sergeant major, if you like. And I got posted to the PT school in Germany as a chief instructor, so I was a boss of the school out there. And I had, because of my age, I had one opportunity for a commission. And the five people before me in that job didn't get a commission. So I thought, okay, the writing's on the wall. They're trying to tell me something. You're not going to get a commission. So I just cracked on with pitting everything right, linking up with the PT school, getting all the lessons linked up so that we were concurrent with the PT school in Aldershot. And unbeknown to me, the brigadier, who was the commandant of the PT Corps many years ago, he knew what I was going through. And um, we'd invite him down for the pass-off periods and that, but that's all. And then the big day came and he called me into his office and he says, do you know, I said, no, this was the results of the commissioning board. I says, no, I don't. My legs are shaking. I don't know what you're going to tell me, but I, t- I wish you'd tell me because I'm going to fall over. <laughs> I was literally shaking. I was so nervous. And he says, well, that's great. Congratulations um, you're on your commissioning. Well deserved. And I said, I was chatting to him after. I says, how did you, how do you know? And he says, just because I don't see you doesn't mean I don't see you. Mm. And I've learned from that, you know, because people talk. We were doing all sorts. We're doing every, you know, the, the, the guys who came out of the PT school Germany, because of the team, Stu Irvin and um, Richie Windard, who were my two, my two main people. And then uh, Eric Sykes took over as a sergeant major. He was good. Uh, he, was, he was a relief to have a good, a good sergeant major in. And um, the troops that, the students that we pr- produced were really, really knowledgeable because we did it we, we had some spare capacity so we added some in that and um, that the pt school all shot couldn't do because of the size mm. of the school and everything but but we had the, the the capacity to do it so and it was all to do with organizing 
competitions. So we'd say, right, we're going to do a charity competition. And tell them why we're doing a charity for that school down there. So that one, they know who we are. And two, they get the benefit by getting some money and they can get computers or whatever. But the thing is, the students got the benefit of organising the competition and seeing the value it brings and, and the, the, um, the publicity it brings as well. So, yeah, it was great. And then I got a commission and I carried on uh, getting posted and that. Um, and then um, I ended up um, as the SO1 as a lieutenant colonel at Army headquarters. And I I was writing policy, a, a new policy for, that my brief was, I want you to write a policy that for assurance of physical training, adventures training and sport that will withstand heavy government scrutiny that was it and i'm like wow so i'm going around scratching my head for days and days thinking looking at other assurance branches see what they do but what i found out quite quickly was assurance of people is different to assurance of assets cars vehicles you mm. name it guns and bullets it was different but then i got my head around it and i'm writing it and i wrote this piece of work and I, honestly it, it's still in place now it was my best piece of work ever but you know that legacy from the teachers came back, I'm writing it, and I'll make a mistake. And the first thing I say to myself is, you're stupid. Even as a lieutenant colonel, I'm still saying I'm stupid. I mean, this has been all my career. All of my career, I've been telling myself I'm stupid because of what they said. But as a lieutenant colonel, writing this policy, I knew it was a good policy, just had to articulate it. And I'm saying, you're stupid. And the thing is, teachers need to to take, to own this and remember, I mean, them teachers can't because they're probably not, not around now, but Teachers need to remember, and people in authority, that if you're an authority and you tell somebody something negative, they will remember that. They really will, and it'll have a profound effect on their future, in some cases, mm-hmm. like on mine. I still, during my, my PTSD therapy, I can't believe I'm telling you about PTSD, um, one of the things was me being stupid. And then she said, write down everything you've done. And I wrote it down, and I still thought, I mean, it was massive. You know, I'm I'm the only person alive in Purbright Training Camp, which is going to be the academy for training, that has a troop named after him um, and goes down and talks to them. I'm the only person in the British Army, as far as I know, that rode in the Calgary Stampede Parade on a horse in uniform. You know, I've done so many firsts. And I still think, I still criticise myself. And then... It, it was hard work. The therapist had a hard job to get that stupidity tablet out of my mm. my stomach because it had been there since child, you know. So I just I, my heart goes out to all those kids who are struggling because of not being mentored or, or guided or or given the right lessons that that stimulate their brains because they're not all bad kids. You know, a lot of I mean the ones I know they're only bad because they're bored. Yeah, you know? there's not many that are bad through and through. That I've met. Yeah, I remember but, seeing a video of a kid. I don't know whether it was the UK or the US, but he was in a um a bit of a segregation bit. So it's almost like a cubicle, and he's been sat there and he's watching something to do with his lesson. And the kid is sitting there and he's, you know, he's fidgeting and he's looking up and all the rest of it. And then it cuts scene and it's it's the same kid, but it's, say, for example, it's Star Wars that he's watching and that kid is just sat there. Completely still, completely silent, just so in tune to it. And it often makes me think that, you know, you, you watch program, programs like Educating Yorkshire and there's some kids you think, you are such a fucking little arsehole. You keep disrupting this lesson. You just need something to give you a good smack. Chances are, he might have ADHD, he might have ADD. They've just not found that what makes him tick. It makes him switch to, right, I can fully absorb this. Like you said, you call it your superpower. Mm. You know, th- there are so many kids out there who they might have no concept of written English or maths, but they can sit there, can draw from memory of something they saw 10 years ago. And I think this is partly the reason why standardized testing is absolute bullshit. Because all standardized yeah. testing is is memory. Yeah. You know, um, well, that's that's another discussion. Um, conscious that we're running out of time. Um, there's one question that I ask every guest, and I am massively putting you on the spot here, but I think you're going to have a crack and answer. What does serving in the military mean to you? 
I, it means, it means I'm a decent person. It means that I've always had this thing in my head that there's a, there's a, something's happened, a fire or a war or whatever, and there's a woman there, or it could be an accident, there's a woman there crying, and I walk up to her and I say, come with me, I'm in the British Army, you're safe now. It's that assurance, you know, and I'm getting goosebumps now. We do the right thing. I'm getting goosebumps as well, actually, that's so weird. Yeah, <laughs> because, you, you know, you wear the uniform, and the thing is, some people don't get it. You, every day you put that uniform on, you're making a pact with, your, with yourself that you will, you will protect the people of this nation. Even the racists, even the, the bigots, you know, you're going to protect them. And you could protect them by you, you, the ultimate sacrifice, by dying for them. Yet they're still also some of them, you know. Mm. But for me, I can't let that bother me. I still believe that mantra that, yeah, I could die for you. Well, not specifically for you, but I could die in doing something to save you. But that's what I signed up for. I mean, I didn't sign up to, to die, but that's what you sign up for. You're taking on this role and you're a soldier 24 seven in uniform or out uniform. And I'll tell you what, when I used to walk around, I used to, in my last job in, in the army, I ran the army youth outreach team, which was a, my best team ever in terms of achievements. Um, and I traveled down to London on train weekly, you know, t- some t- three, four times a week sometimes. And I'd be in uniform and people look at me with admiration. Yet when I'm in civilians, they look at me sometimes in disgust and it's like, you can't win, you can't win. But serve, being in the army to me is all about doing the right service. It's not just service, it's doing the right service. You are there, a pillar of strength when all around is chaos. You can right. stand up there and say, come with me, you're safe now. A bit like a, bit like a, um, a superhero fireman, something like that, you know? Smashing. Perfect answer. <laughs> awesome. Right. Well, thank you again very much. Thank you again for joining me. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure and uh, all the best in writing your book. Thanks, Crash. Cheers. All the best. Thank you for listening to the Stand Easy podcast with your host, Crash Stevenson. Join in the discussion over on the Facebook page at fb.me forward slash stand easy podcast.